Hey everyone, my name is Alex Weidauer. I'm the co-founder and CEO here over at Raza. And I'm super excited today um, to have this panel discussion beyond POCs, proof of concepts, choosing and operationalizing a conversational AI platform for enterprise scale. And this is actually a panel that is continued from our last major event, Raza Summit in February, um, where we had the same group here and then really concluded that there's just so much more to enterprise scale and so for today, we have a couple of more topics that we'll cover, and I'm really excited for that. Um, at the beginning, I just quickly wanted to bring everyone up to speed, um, what we mean when we talk about a conversational AI platform. Um, so they are really like the foundational technology for development of chatbots and virtual assistants. That's at least how Gartner defines it. And I think it's a pretty good def definition. And when we think of like just how that all works and what it really means, the best way that I came across so far to put this is really that you have your consumer or customer, if you will, um, and basically the conversational AI or assistant and text or voice-based assistant and chatbot is really sitting between you as a company on the left here and the customer and the user in the end. Um, and so basically the simple task, and I say like simple in quotation marks here really, um, is to just basically help your customer um, put in their own words what they need and then translate that into your logic and into your systems and into your departments. Um, and that's, of course, something that, you know, seems pretty easy. And I think a lot of people who start building those things um, start thinking that way. But then it turns out that it's actually much harder. And when we talk about enterprise scale, I think there's a whole other level to all of this. Um, and there are just so many, many more like channels and like different types of consumers and customers and users. But at the same time, you also just have so many more like departments and different systems as backend systems. Some of them might be pretty legacy. And so when we talk about enterprise scale, that can really have like a lot of different faces and dimensions. And you can think of like quality assurance is like an important topic there, um, but also approval processes. You might have like certain limitations around deployments and you generally probably have larger teams. And you're also probably going to have many more like natural languages, right? I mean, if you think of um, the US, um, of course, English is an important one. And then also Spanish is an important one. And there are many, many more that you might want to support, especially if you go internationally. Um, and then really, you also just have increased traffic. And so all of those different dimensions come together when like a large bank is building an assistant for tens of millions of customers. Um, and so for today's panel, um, we'll basically dive a little deeper into all of this. And as I said at the beginning, I think really like the short conclusion from last time was, it's really hard to fit enterprise scale into a 40 minute panel. Um, we'll try again today <laughs> um, and have another 40 minutes. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, and so we have uh, Casey here today, uh, Vinit and Dennis and Sweta again, and I'm super excited um, for that. And they're gonna introduce themselves in a minute as well. Um, but just to bring everyone up to speed, like kind of, I think our high level lessons from the last conversations were that this transition from a proof of concept into production really completely changes how voice and text-based assistants are being built, right? And it's not just the platform, but it's also really the processes, it's the people that you need, different teams and like how they all work together. And um, the other important thing is really the customer experience should scale with the technology as well to ensure high quality. And um, I think it's a point that Vinit made last time that technology actually scales pretty well these days. Um, but you want to make sure that the customer experience um, goes with that as well. And it's, I think, important when you look at customer satisfaction. Um, and then last but not least, um, we talked a lot about like what success criteria look like um, in enterprises. And I think the short version of this is it depends. It really depends on the use case and the business goal. Um, and I think um, Dennis actually made a great point last time that from this phase of like proof of concept into production, what also changes is the motivation, right? Because in the beginning, like everything is cool, new innovation. It's like, oh, there's like, you know, a chatbot or the voice assistant or Alexa is like a new platform. Let's try it out. Um, and so once that kind of innovation phase um, is over and people like learned about how maybe their customers would adopt it, it really transitions into the line of business where you in the end, you know, have different objectives probably. And so that also changes a lot on like how people look at success. Um, and so a couple of examples here are like containment, if you think of customer service use cases or customer satisfaction, as I just mentioned. The recording from last time is online 
Um, on our website, uh, if you want to check that out, it's at rasa.com slash summit. I um, highly recommend you uh, like also watching that recording. Um, and so without further ado, I would say, let's get started so we don't run out of time again. <laughs> we'll try our best um, to cover as much ground as possible. Um, and I'd love for um, all the panelists to just quickly introduce themselves. Okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, hello everyone, this is uh, Sveta Patel. I uh, specialize in conversational AI products and technology. I have built uh, a few conversational AI products, uh, Erica from Bank of America and Oracle Digital Assistant from Oracle. Um, and currently I'm driving product transformation at Juniper Networks. Nice to be here. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Sveta. Hi hey everyone, uh, I'm Casey Phillips, uh, Senior Product Manager at Intuit for Conversational AI um, and Messaging. Uh, yeah, I've been working as a Product Manager in the Conversational AI space for going uh, close to five years now. So I've built a lot of chatbots, both at uh, the smaller scale, um, like more so like startup midsize, uh, but more so extensively and recently uh, at the enterprise scale. Thanks, Casey. Hi, happy to go next. Uh, my name is Vineet Malhotra. Um, I uh, work at Mercer um, and I'm a, uh, I lead a team called Alpha Labs and also run our test and learn program. Uh, we've been working with Rasa and in the AI space for a while now, and we look at um, implementation from both a, a colleague experience perspective, but also how it can serve our clients and end users as well. Cool, thanks Vineet. Hey everyone, I'm Dennis Yang. Um, I am the lead product manager for conversational AI at Chime. Uh, and Chime is a technology company providing banking services for members to, to really uh, give our members the financial peace of mind. Um, prior to Chime, uh, I've been through five different startups, three time co founder, uh, twice as an ninth employee. And my last company uh, is a company called Dashbot, uh, which provides analytics and uh, for chatbots. So I've been in this kind of chat ecosystem for a little while now. So it's great to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Um, yeah, and so I think to kick things off, um, I would love to um, talk a little bit about kind of still the uh, predominant topic everywhere in the world, um, COVID-19, um, which of course, um, as we record this here, um, is, you know, at least in uh, the countries that I think we all in, um, getting a little better and um, hopefully we're going to get through this very soon. Um, but of course, I think what definitely is something that a lot of people, um, and it's really the obvious thing, um, have seen is that this just drove a lot of like digital inter um, really interactions everywhere across all channels. Um, and, and so I think what I wanted to talk with you about at the beginning is a little bit in this context of also enterprise scale um, that we had um, as the topic of this panel. Um, how really has COVID-19 changed the considerations for an enterprise to deploy conversational AI at scale? Um, and maybe we can start there. And then I'd love to also touch base on, on like, now that we're coming out of this, is that something that will last basically in terms of like how people thought about um, deploying conversational AI um, during these times? Um, and if not, um, what are the changes that you would expect in the long run? So Alex, I think, um... Oh, I guess I'll go first. Um, sure. Before we talk about enterprise scale for conversational AI, the one thing that became very prominent during the COVID um, uh, pandemic is the digital transformation, the need for digital transformation. So companies that, that were ahead in digital transformation were able to adapt much faster to the next step, which is automation. And that's, that's sort of where the um, demand increased suddenly overnight. Uh, and companies that, that did not have that, they had to accelerate or they found themselves accelerating in the digital transformation so they could get to automation. So I think from, from uh, an impact point of view, it's, it's been two folds. And, and obviously there was a heavy dependency on the digital transformation for automation. But uh, from an enterprise scale point of view, if we just look at the first genre of companies, um, they definitely, um, I think the decision-making uh, became much faster from a conversational AI adoption strategy if they didn't already have one. Um, and from a scaling point of view, if, if the companies already had digital assistance at POC level, the testing, the adoption just became really fast because everything pretty much moved um, online. And to keep the operational efficiency and to keep the uh, business um, uh, running 
it, it was pretty much a, a fast overnight uh, transformation. So I think that's that's been very, very obvious and vis visible in the scale point. Yeah, there's, yeah, I mean, there's a, oh, sorry. Okay, no, okay. Okay, so basically, I guess I'll echo that point that uh, that Sway is making. It's essentially, is like COVID, one of the biggest shifts that it's sort of done for our society, and is that this concept of kind of open hours um, is sort of blurred when you are no longer visiting physical locations, right? So uh, more and more customers are are expecting twenty four by seven um, access to you know to support and help, and that simply you know, is is really really benefited by having digital assistance available for to meet the customers wherever they are. So I think that's sort of accelerating um, you know, that transformation as, as what they're saying. And, and for the companies that have that that had digital assistance prior to COVID, I think you know, they were definitely ready to meet that that challenge and and benefited frankly from an increase of scale which with which we can improve our assistance. Right. So I think I think that was a big shift. Yeah and I would just add to um to everything that 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 Dennis and, and Sweda said about that. I think a, another thing that it definitely did with the COVID-19 pandemic is it really showcased to highlight like the benefit and the need to be able to rapidly adapt <clears throat> um, with your conversational AI experiences. Because if you think about like not only did COVID-19 like rapidly increase digital adoption, but it also changed our lives dramatically, like the way that we live our lives. So if you think about from a lot of companies, it, it didn't even just like cause them to have to accelerate their digital adoption. But completely change. Like if you're thinking, if you have a chatbot that's going to answer customer service questions or something about your business, you're gonna even if you had a chatbot before COVID nineteen, you'd have to quickly swarm on changing that chatbot and changing its answers and having it be able to answer all these new questions that users have. Like, are you still open during the pandemic? Like, like has this policy changed because of COVID nineteen pandemic? So just kind of really showcase um, like the need, but also like. I think one of the, the really powerful capabilities of conversational AI is that you can, like if you know what you're doing and you have the right team and processes in place, you can rapidly adapt and swarm on something huge like the COVID-19 pandemic and be able to change your experience to now users are actually getting the right answers to their questions in this brand new uh, pandemic world where things are completely different than they were before. Yeah. I you know, I mean, I would just, at the, at the risk of not repeating anything um, that's been said, I would say that we talk a lot about digital transformation. I think um, with, with the pandemic, we were in a situation of digital desperation. And, and what that basically meant is that wherever you were on your learning curve and acceptance curve for, for digital, it was out the window. You, you just had to react and, and do what you needed to do to keep the lights on, keep your business running, et cetera. And a lot of uh, positive creativity came out of that. And that's going to persist after the pandemic. There are lots of things in our personal space and in the workspace, whether it's how you get your groceries and your meals delivered to how you work, that's going to continue uh, past the pandemic because we've all seen how much easier things can be as well. And, and, and so that will persist. And my own experience has been that, uh, you know, Mercer is part of Marshall and McLennan. Uh, we have about 15,000 colleagues in India at the moment. And... We, in, in three weeks, we built a crisis response application to help colleagues uh, get access to blood, platelet, platelet donations, oxygen concentrators, register for vaccinations, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And we're already thinking about conversational AI now as a feature set for that crisis response experience, just because of the way people want to get the information they need. And, and well past the pandemic, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing you never want to have to use again, but, but it's shown us what we can build for and be ready for going forward as well. So, so a lot of interesting good things have come out of this. Yeah, that's uh, such a good point. And also like building on, on Casey's point around like how what people are asking changes so quickly and dramatically. I think that always reminds me of um, what my co-founder says uh, when, when he talks about conversation driven development. Um, it's kind of the big premise with conversational AI is that you really hear what your customer wants, right? And you just have to listen. <laughs> I think that just have to listen is uh, really also the tricky part in all of this, especially if you have like millions of customers um, talking to an assistant. So it gets really tricky to like go through all of those. Um, but I think the point is also that this is such, such a more powerful technology than really like web and mobile um, as alternatives here, because you know people will land on your website 
Um, and they might tell you what they need if they use a search bar, but if not, you really just don't know and you try to infer that from analytics. Um, and in this case, you know, if you can listen and if you know what they're asking for, you will find out that, for example, happened to one of our big retail customers. Um, and I think it's also nothing new. Um, and maybe in hindsight, it sounds like a funny story now, but of course, everyone was asking for toilet paper, right? In the early days of the pandemic, when there was a challenge everywhere in the world, I think. Um, and so basically, they just super quickly within a couple of days um, build that into the assistant um, and not just to say like, well, we might be running out of it, but you can actually talk to the assistant, know which store has it, which doesn't. Um, and it really helps people also just from not going to the store if they just need that, right? And so really help them to stay at home if, if there wasn't toilet paper in that store. And um, that's just a small example, but of course in every industry that that happens all the time, right? And I think um, that's really the, the, big, the big power here of the technology. And when you think about like maybe um, the the next um, like years or so, um, I think we probably, it sounds like we all agree that a lot of those things will stay. And like, I think people have seen now what power like conversational AI specifically can have. And I think anything digital in general. Um, but do, how, do, how do you think about like, I guess what becomes important um, once people kind of, you know, start to think a bit more strategically again from these like tactical things now and um, when they think of like conversational AI and like their strategy. I think I think you gave a tip in there um, with with the context driven uh, conversation and I think that's uh, that the need for that context driven conversation will scale quite a bit uh, because um, I think so far large amount of use case was more in Q and A general informational and transactional um, experience but uh, as as the scales um, and the long term implementation and maturity of the uh, conversational systems occur, um, I think context is going to become more and more uh, prominent, and and context driven systems are going to be become a bigger need from even the user point of view. Because I think the barrier is broken already. That hey, I can you know the omni channel presence, twenty four seven service, self self assisted uh, um, uh, you know self help or self transactions. Uh, all that is already getting ac uh, accelerated, but in the next few years, it's it's really going to be a historical interaction with the assistant and how that context-driven uh, conversation actually differentiates um, interaction for the users. I, I I think that's where the focus is going to be. Yeah, I, I I'd say that looking into a kind of a crystal ball, I I wouldn't I, I would I have a, a hypothesis that. We've been looking at conversational AI as a, as not. I don't want to use the words replacement, especially with with this this group and audience, because we know that's not the case. This is about augmentation and 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 complementing everything else. But I I wonder if there is actually going to be a shift also towards just to build on context. This notion that it's not it's less of a conversation, but it's more about automating what needs to happen. So using a conversational style of engagement to request tasks or jobs to be done or to be told something at the right place and time uh, and so you know we just we, we, I mean, we, we saw this happening in the, in the personalization industry space a while many many years ago where it became you know segments of one i wonder if the context is going to be the same that my context is always going to be unique to me and i can use conversational ai to action a list of a litany of things that i want to get done um, and really think of Alexa on steroids in the workplace, getting all kinds of tasks and automation done, but it's the conversational style of engagement. I think, I think there's something there that, that we'll see play out in the next sort of, you know, 12, 18 plus months. Yeah, I, I definitely um, a, a agree completely. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I think the, what we're seeing a lot of with with chatbots, I think it's going to really continue over the next or the next few years. It's just um, a lot better adoption of, of user data, and not just data in the way users interact with the chatbots, and you know, like using that for better training, but actually um, just like a lot more like adoption of user data and experiences. So I think like a lot of companies now are understanding like let's build API integrations and let's scale this data in for users. I think once you start to do that, you're able to get those contextual experiences. You're not having to ask the user so many follow-ups questions like do you fit this criteria do you fit this criteria like if you have if it's your user and they're authenticated like 
you have all this data on them and you know these things about us. You don't need to ask those follow-up questions. The user can ask a question and you can instantly send them to an answer because you know who that user is. So you could be at the enterprise level, you could have an intent that maybe has like 20 different variations of the responses based on certain criteria from the user. But they're authenticated, you know that, the user should just be able to ask that question and they go there. You shouldn't have to ask them like, oh, well, are you in the state of California or New York? Are you like a full-time employee or part-time employee? Like, you should know that and take them directly to the answer and let the user know that because ultimately if they're your user and they're authenticated, you know them. And I think users are going to start to have the expectation like I'm logged into your platform, you know who I am, you know what state I'm in, you know what my employee, like, why are you asking this? So I think like getting that data in and getting that built in and incorporating that, I think it's like, it's already starting to happen. I think it's gonna really start to become like, users are just gonna expect it uh, very soon. Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things that I'm I'm looking forward to is I'm, I'm sort of describing this as like a compounding flywheel of conversational AI. So as, as more of our assistants are receiving more more and more conversations and data, you know, starting with kind of very single turn FAQ experiences, we can then start to really drive and see which actions our, our customers want us to do and then eventually re reach that level that Casey was describing, which is like a, like predicting what they actually are, are asking about or here for, um, you know, in another way we can kind of think of this as, you know, how, how might we surprise and delight our, our users and customers um, in, and basically, since you know, what Alex was saying before is that our customers are telling us exactly what they wish we did through these interfaces. And, and since you're able to accelerate the development process and shorten the time to cover those use cases, you can essentially really look to see what they wish you did, cover it really quickly, and then keep compounding it. And a great example here, I would say like both of the voice assistants from Amazon and Google started off with the ability to translate languages, which I, which I discovered. And then they kind of compounded on that and they can now flip into entire translator mode, like Babelfish mode, which is amazing. And I think that that sort of like flywheel of the, surely they're looking at the, like who was asking for it and then adding it and then adding more and more kind of building on top of that. So I think those little nuggets of, of you know, compounding delight Will really spin this flywheel into something amazing, um, and I think, I think we're we're on the on the cusp of kind of starting to do that, which I'm super excited about. So, yeah, and I think what we also hear from a lot of companies these days um, is that just COVID has put so much pressure that a lot of people that were kind of more on the conservative slash doubting side um, and didn't really believe in chatbots or maybe had bad experiences when um, this new wave started about four years ago. Um, and, and Dennis and I uh, remember these days, I think pretty well, <laughs> that's how we met. Um, I think also now so I just had to see basically that it adds actually quite a lot of value and also the technology improved, of course, since then. Um, so yeah, I also I think of it as also a bit of a renaissance of chatbots and, and voice assistants. Um, and so there's a lot of like opportunity ahead, I think for the next few years, it's really exciting. Cool. Um, one thing that I wanted to like dive a little bit deeper, which I think we also hadn't as much time in the last panel. And I think Vinny, you said this like that the customer experience has to scale as well, right? Like in the enterprise. And um, would love to just hear your thoughts around like maybe also what the landscape and reality looks like today when it comes to customer experience in a large enterprise, right? Um, and, and maybe kind of how things run at the moment um, and and maybe how conversational AI could help in that context at some point in time. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Just since that last conversation, uh, I had a, I've been observing a few few things. Firstly, we've launched a program around test and learn, which allows people to submit ideas for experiments that we can execute. And I share that in the context of customer experience. Um, because what I'm finding is that there is an awareness in our own organization that, that you can actually synthesize customer experiences across multiple products, solutions, et cetera. And that itself is the scaling of the conversational AI piece right there, because now you're saying that a customer who's buying X from you may also be buying Y and Z, but that experience, and especially the conversational experience doesn't have to be isolated to a particular product or solution. That is the that conversational piece is your is kind of your brand presence uh, in a digitized way, uh, and it could span any product or solution that you offer the client. 
And so there's a tremendous opportunity there that I'm seeing already to look at how it can scale just by virtue of where we're going and how our organization is starting to think about this. Um, and, and so I, I think it, it, that pace of organic uh, 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 direction is, is, is actually quite accelerated because people are sort of saying, hey, I wanna bring this experience together across all my products and solutions for my clients and conversational AI just flows through all of that as well. So I see that as a really positive change since we last spoke. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think people have been really asking me like what, what I think the, the future of like my team and conversational AI is. Um, and realistically, I think the, the long future of, of the conversational AI team is that the team itself should go away in the same way that like there's no kind of team that's responsible for mobile app development. It's really just a tool that all the product functions across the organization incorporate into delivering their solutions, right? So and I think that's sort of, um, you know, it, it becomes another solution with which we, we can use at the appropriate time, you know, including the websites, mobile, mobile apps, um, and conversation. And I think that that's sort of uh, the, the long view I have on conversational AI is, is really just permeates all product management or all products in general. Um, and maybe if there were to be a conversation, conversational AI team, it's more of like a centralized best practices unit, or maybe a forward looking, um, you know, uh, innovation type thinking unit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and in terms of the customer experience, I think a big shift that I've seen lately is that, you know, really focusing in on customer satisfaction as compared to like other metrics, um, like containment or reflection is something that uh, one of the big reasons why I joined my current role is we, you know, we do focus on satisfaction as our primary and I think that that's the right way to look at it because it really affords you, you know, some really interesting and frankly more difficult challenges um, when you're focusing on satisfaction. Um, you should always kind of probably be, probably be keeping an eye on containment and deflection, but ultimately, like making an awesome customer experience should benefit like the entire company as well as your customers as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. I, I was just going to say, I think the dependency on the customer experience definitely increased exponentially uh, uh, thanks to the pandemic in a weird way. Uh, but um, uh, the way I look at uh, customers' uh, experience, um, you know, focus right now is fast, relevant, and precise information at scale. And, and scale is pretty much uh, exactly what we need, uh, we need uh, laid out, that it's, it's not just a, a cluster of products, it's across the board that we want the conversational AI to uh, to be proficient in uh, information-wise because customers are just expecting that more and more. And I think the primary driver of that is obviously how everything just went into a digital um, interaction mode. So now it's, it, it's almost like a bottleneck of information that, oh, I got one good information in one genre of uh, you know area, but what about the rest? And I still have a need over there. So that, that sort of... Um, you know, brought in this uh, this need for at scale, the fast, relevant, and precision uh, information, right? Because this again, there's too much information out there, and users don't really have patience for um, you know long blogs or paragraphs of information. They just want uh, precision information to what they're searching for. So yeah. yeah. I, I, I sorry, Casey, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, you know, just to kind of uh, extend on the points that was made about the customer experience. I think, especially from uh, from my perspective, I think you know, if you think of like product management, I think that in terms of customer experience, I think that there's starting to become, or there at least like should definitely be higher standards in terms of the conversational AI experiences uh, that you're building. I think you know one of the reasons for that is there's I think just historically users I think a lot of times have like a negative connotation about chatbots if they see chatbot kind of like oh god this is going to be terrible and I think that's part of the expense of I think very early on like years ago there's this rapid push for chatbots but the technology wasn't really there so a lot of times they didn't perform very well they could they could only provide static answers there really was no AI built into it just kind of like this frustrating kind of conversation tree and, and, and loops and stuff so I think that you're you were still at the stage where you're having to um, you know, to kind of prove users wrong, uh, you know, so to speak, and let them know that, hey, your chatbot can, can do a lot better for that. And I think as well, like one of the things that I always try to keep in mind from a customer experience standpoint, I think in a lot of cases, the chatbots are being used in like a, a customer support or like a you know, customer service space. And historically, a lot of times the companies are just more so like a community and there'd be search and users could kind of like 
self-serve more so for answers and like the answers were there but users would have to dig and find them but from my standpoint like it's a completely different expectation when you get into conversational ai because when a user asks a chatbot a question and you provide an answer like to me like that should be like high confidence and you should like really feel confident that that answer that you're showing the user is, is correct it's not like you're sending the user to like a microsite or a landing page and you're saying search for your answer or find the one that you're saying like you ask the question and here's your answer so i think it's like a completely different ball game on the expectations of understanding that providing a, a, a wrong answer via chatbot to me is a much more damaging user experience and more damaging to a brand than a user using your search experience on a microsite and the first search result isn't the right one to me the chatbot experience with the wrong answer is much more damaging i think it's just really important to consider that you know unlike your product and the customer experience just also like your your brand and what the users think of your brand as well yeah that's such a good point um and i think in general um the way how i look at customer experience today is also that in many ways your customer still has to navigate the org chart of your company um and so it's you know things are really like spread out in, in different silos um, you have like a digital team, which, you know, might maintain like a web application or mobile application. Um, and then you usually have like an operations part of the company that maintains the service center. And of course, I mean, in good companies, I think they talk to each other <laughs> in some way, but still, I think you're like kind of the, the burden is, if you will, on the customer uh, to figure out the right place. Um, and I think what we see now actually starting to happen is that these um, like conversational teams um, that, um, for example, Dennis is running, um, I think start to bring together those different departments in some way, right? Like we're just thinking like of one example recently uh, with a large bank where they basically build an assistant first in their mobile app and now they're um, like loyalty points. Um, other team came over to them and were like, well, maybe we can combine it together here and people might not have to, you know, log into this other portal that we have to like figure out your loyalty points for your credit card. Um, and I think that's actually interesting, um, but it also, you know, to be honest, requires a lot of like organizational change. And I think those are, you know, I think the hardest normally. And um, so it's like, you know, pretty easy to adopt a new technology, but I think to change the organization and also like making sure that, um, you know, folks, um, I think realize that in the end, it's about the customer experience and not so much about like what departments exist. I think that's just a kind of mindset shift that slowly starts to happen and materialize. And, and I think it will take another couple of years for sure. Yeah, uh, you know, it's kind of close out in, in, the, in, the, in terms of the, sort of the scaling of, of this capability and experience. And I kind of feel like it's, it's back to basics, which is the simplest uh, thing for me right now is that the value proposition of conversational AI is still the invisible handoff. So, so, you know, in the real world, I'm speaking to someone and I'll say, oh, let me get someone, uh, you know, who's a specialist to speak to you, or I'm going to hand you off to this X team. And, and it, it can be a frustrating experience as you're buying, engaging, getting support. And there's an invisible handoff with virtual assistants that the smarter they get, you don't know where that domain knowledge and expertise is coming from. It could be coming from eight different repositories and teams and re resources. But to the end user, it's a seamless experience. And I think that basic promise of conversational AI still holds true and is what will help us scale this as well. Because as we get more sophisticated at this, we start to deliver a whole lot better on that promise of conversational AI as well. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. I think one like main use case that we touched on um, in our last conversation in February was all about like customer service automation, right? And I think we, we also today uh, got pulled into that direction because I think it seems to be uh, the largest and most like scalable use case inside enterprises, um, especially the ones that have like tens of millions of customers. And um, when you think about like the future of contact centers or like the contact center, um, if you will itself, um, if you would have to pick like who built it? I'm curious to hear your opinions on that. Um, like, is it more like developers? Is it contact center agents? Um, is it maybe a mix of the two? Um, maybe completely other groups? Um, and the reason I'm asking is because it's a conversation that I have with a lot of like uh, leaders these days. Um, because I think there are lots of different like schools of thought. Um, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
with the um, with the start of digital assistance about a few years ago, um, we started out the the tie up with the contact center was to hand off to the human agent. So we already tried the, the bot logic uh, and, and when you run into dead end, that's kind of where. So from a back end system point of view, the integration was really more, hey, call for help. Um, you know, that shift is is now going from, you know, call for help to actually driving the contact center through the digital assistant and then really just more of an assistive backend support for some of the complex scenarios or whatnot. Um, that's that's the trend that that it's going. So I think the the complexity and 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 uh, change is at uh, multiple layers. From a user point of view, obviously the uh, the change is pretty obvious. The self help is increasing from uh, the digital assistant interaction. From a contact center point of view, the training of the contact center uh, individuals on how to handle the handoffs from the digital assistant and and um, we need brought up the invisible handoff, right? So there there's combination of different variety of how that handoff occurs and and skill set training from that point of view that that's increasing. And then I think infrastructurally the the systems integrating and and sort of merging in the back end uh, that that can allow the conversational, technology to lead the contact center interaction and then uh, hand it off to the traditional um, human assisted contact center that that's that's the areas I think is uh, is where the change uh, change and shift is going yeah absolutely and I'd say um, you know Alex to, to kind of like your point of like you know what does the ideal contact center look like or the contact center of the future I think that uh, like ideally it needs to be a very diverse group. Like I think you need to have you know, people involved like on the, the technical side, like the developers and engineers. But I think regardless of, you know, no matter how advanced conversational AI gets, I think you're always going to have to the piece where you're going to always have to have the contact center agents in the mix. Because I do like you could build the best chatbot and it could have like the most crazy um, conversational AI capabilities. But if you don't actually train it based on what users need and the answers that they need, it's not, it's not going to provide any value. So you have to have those people that truly really understand like your product or your domain and, and what your users really need. And I think the contact, the, the contact center agents really understand that as well. I know some companies um, also have like customer experience contact specialists that people that just like really focus on certain um, experiences or certain use cases or problems that users have in solving those. So I think that you're always going to want to have those in the mix. I think as well, like you're going to need like product people in the mix that can kind of speak both languages where they can interact with your developers and the more so technical people, the engineers, but they can also still like digest and understand, you know, the, the, what's coming from the contact center agents and being able to kind of figure out what's the experience we need to build. I think there's also be a component where you're gonna now have um, the kind of the, the data science piece aspect of it and like having people on the data side to really try and take all of this, this data that you're gonna get from the contact center agents, just the contact center in general, being able to like digest in a way that you can make actionable insights on it and not just get overwhelmed by millions of data points and you're kind of, you know, you're paralyzed by uh, by the amount of data you have. So from my perspective, like, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's starting to become a very diverse group. And I think the more diverse group the contact center can be, I think you're just going to see better results for, for the company and then for the end users. Yeah, I mean, from the, from the way I see it, um, you know, as we're, we're building this, what Alex said, so what would you call it? The contact center of the future. Um, kind of having a better, like, integration between kind of the automated experiences and our human experiences is sort of um, what's going to empower the ultimate ultimate problem, which is, you know, how do we provide like the best customer experience um, in an empathetic way in, in a very efficient way, right? So in the same way that we, you know, are writing a, a conversational digital assistance to understand what the, what the customers are saying, you know, having, like turning these agents around and and really facing them towards our customers, customer uh, support agents and having them essentially have an assistant as well to suggest, you know, hey, you know, it, it, it sounds like this customer is very angry. Maybe like try to, you know, give them, you know, listen to them a little bit more or giving them the live feedback, you know, it might be in interesting solutions that we can explore. 
Um, as well as, you know, when we do hand off between the digital assistant and the human agents, like providing them like a really concise dossier or, or a synopsis of what, what has been discussed before um, to really accelerate the understanding and nuanced empathy that the human agents can provide, right? So, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, like we're, it's really just, these tools are, are evolving so quickly and the ability to understand is evolving, evolving very quickly. But I think the integration into the processes and workflows to ultimately deliver like an amazing, like I keep saying empathetic because I think that's the next level is really like, what's the difference between an answer and an answer that really makes me feel good about you know what, what you're saying. And I think that's, that's a key thing as we kind of really continue to develop, to develop these um, kind of customer service experiences. That's that's a, a, a that's a good point. You brought, uh, if, if I can chime in just for a little bit, yeah. um, you you brought in um, you know there there's an uh, there is an invisible user uh, that's that's um, um, uh, brewing up in this shift of assistive to um, you know leading with uh, digital assistance. It's the contact central agent, and um, you know th there are two 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 areas there the the system implementation that I initial implementation that I have seen, we, we pass on the entire transcript or log to to the contact center agent and, and then they take it from there, right? They have to scroll through that too. So summarization or you know giving them just the key points that these are the interns we already completed and happy versus these are the ones that you really need help. And here's how you could some instructions on here's how you could get started so that the customer satisfaction levels are maintained. That's a key transition point right there. So a good point yeah totally um and i think there also again um when you think of scale um the whole quality aspect and dennis you mentioned this like customer satisfaction like really also comes in again um maybe any uh, parting uh advice for folks um how to ensure high quality um just from a like team standpoint or processes standpoint especially if you scale right because i think that's a big risk if you have like 10 users for your assistant, like nobody cares. If you have like tens of millions at that scale, um, you do really care. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, a, it's a mix, right? Of, of having good quantitative measures that can point you towards, um, you know, really digging in and really doing essentially like, you know, qualitative understanding of why the quantitative measures of, of you know, of satisfaction are not being met or being met. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned before, Alex, the amazing thing about having these interfaces is you, is you can read the transcripts and you can understand, uh, you know, what the customer was asking, or you can try to understand, or you can see why, why we didn't understand them, right? Um, instead of being, of inferring what the customer wants from their, you know, their search, search, search terms and what they clicked on a website, like the ability to really qualitatively try to discern the nuanced kind of state of mind that the customer was in. Uh, is is a huge huge advantage of these systems um, and putting in the processes in place to kind of quantitate get it, get a quantitative view on at scale uh, and then essentially having those quantitative signals point you towards where you really need to do that qualitative understanding and those two together will ultimately result in develop de you know delivering better and more satisfying experiences to more customers and, and i would add i think from from an experience standpoint, like if you really want to build a chatbot that is going to have like really good customer satisfaction scores, I think it's really important to make sure that you're solving, especially at the enterprise level, you have to be able to solve for every user in one way or another. And like what I mean, like, that just means you have to answer a user question. And the goal should be that the chatbot can answer, you know, the, uh, as many user questions and solve uh, for as many users as possible on its own. But you also have to acknowledge that that's not always going to happen and find other ways to solve for those users. Like if it, you know, if, if a user asks a chatbot a couple questions and it's not answering, then like get them down an escalation path and like hand them over to that agent. Like you need to solve for every single user. You can't just have like, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand. Like, you know, your goal should be to solve as many, solve for as many users as you can via the chatbot on the chatbot answer, but acknowledge that it's not going to happen and making sure that you have still some type of path to resolution for those other users, whether it's like you're directing them to like an FAQ page uh, or you're ideally more so just getting in touch with the human. Like there needs to be some resolution for every single user. And I think when you don't have that, that's when users get really frustrated. So like, I just wasted five minutes and this bot did nothing for me. Like, 
every single uh, interaction needs to have some type of positive resolution. Yeah, totally. And I think because the, we're not trying to answer questions, we're trying, we're making the customer feel taken care of, right? So it's, it's not just answering. It's like, like Casey said, uh, every single experience needs to be, have, have a resolution of some sort. And if it's, if it's talking to a human, pointing, you know, pointing them to the right resource, or just listening. I think that's, <laughs> um, I think it's so important. So. I might take a uh, another perspective on this is that we talk a lot about what we can do as an industry and technologists and, and the maturation of the technology. So I want to also remember this, that there's another person on the other side of this, which is the user or the customer. And I feel we're at a tipping point where I feel that in the, in the, in the near term, there will be greater acceptance that this is for many the preferred way of engaging. We're seeing it already in banking and other sectors where customers prefer to just go into the chat option, given an option to resolve a query than to call a number. And as that starts to, to become the norm, I think there is a certain maturity at the user level where they, they get better at asking questions and having conversations as well, knowing fully well that they're, they're engaging with an algorithm of some kind. And I think that that's a massive shift to a couple of years ago where it was just frustration. It's like, hang on, I already said this. And then, and then they almost kind of yell at a bot. And then, and I think that shift is happening. We're at a tipping point where more and more people are comfortable actually switching to this other channel, knowing fully well what they're dealing with and just having a way to navigate and get what they want out of it. Saying that with complete faith that the technology will continue to get exponentially better as well. Yeah. That's yeah. uh, such a good point. Um, and I think um, that underlying trend of also moving more towards like asynchronous messaging and kind of that eating contact center traffic, like the traditional one through phone is definitely huge. And then I think there's this other wave that I think we all believe in uh, conversational AI eating all of that <laughs> at some point in time. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time again. Um, so, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was great. Thank you all for coming and, and sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm sure as time will unfold, um, we'll see more challenges um, with scaling those systems. So I might bring you back again at some point in time. Um, so thank you so much uh, for joining and yeah, have a great rest of the day. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Pleasure. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Alex.